Take a quick trip, if you will, into Matthew 12. And it's a roundabout way of getting to Jonah. But let's do that together here in Matthew 12. At 38, some of the scribes and Pharisees answered the Lord Jesus, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented into the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater thing than Jonah is here. That's Matthew 12, 38 through 41 there. The sign of the prophet Jonah is something that Jesus himself intoned and is something that he said is like himself, that he would be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, and that the people of Nineveh would be a sign and would be a, a testimony against the current generation who refused to believe in Jesus because the people of Nineveh believed in God through just the word of Jonah, who wasn't the son of God. He was not a greater prophet than Jesus is. Well, we read the account of Jonah in chapter 1, the 17th verse. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So at the time that Jonah was cast overboard from the ship, he was cast into the mouth of this fish that God had prepared, a great fish. I think King James says a whale. But whatever it is, some large creature of the sea that God prepared, what kind of creature is kind of irrelevant, that doesn't really matter. The point is, they've thrown him overboard. It seems that he is dead. And he is taken into the mouth of this fish. And he spends three days and three nights there. It happens in the second chapter, in the 10th verse, the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Which he did. This is the sequence of events for the sign of Jonah, the sequence of events here, that he was cast overboard when he did, he spent or uh, God had prepared this place for him, this fish, where he spent three days and three nights. At the end of that time, he appeared again on dry ground and went into the city of Nineveh to preach. And they listened to him. They listened to him immediately. It was a three-day walk across the city of Nineveh, according to Jonah 3, verse 3. And he was on the first day walk, according to the fourth verse, when in the fifth, the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh. He rose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor animal, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not eat, let them not drink water. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way, from the violence in his hands. Who can tell if God will return and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so we won't perish? Well, that's quite a reception. The word of God was received by these people, and they repented from the least of them to the greatest of them, all the way up to the king. And the king understood, maybe God will turn and relent. 
as in, we deserve to die for the evil we've done, but maybe we can get mercy if we repent. And that's exactly what happened. In Jonah 3.10, God saw their works. They turned from their evil way. He relented from the disaster he said he'd bring on them and did not do it. But they repented. They believed in God. They turned at the preaching of this one. Why? Well, because he came back from the dead. He was spit up onto dry ground from the mouth of this great fish. It says vomited up because Jesus did not crawl out of the grave. He burst forth from the grave. And the men of Nineveh were there at the seashore. It's on the shore. They saw this happen. This man has come back. And we better listen. Why did you come here? What do you have to say? <laughs> and they believed. This, Jesus said, would be a sign for the generation that there he spent three days and three nights, but yet he is alive. And now he has been sent to us with this message from God, what it is that we need to do to be saved. But look again in chapter 2 with me. While Jonah is in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, Jesus said the Son of Man is in the belly of the grave in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. What happens here? Here in Jonah 2, he prays to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. What does that mean? Well, it means this is the prayer of the Lord Jesus from the grave. That's what that means. And as you look at it, you can see, indeed, that is exactly what this is. I cried to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. See, that's what Psalm 22 said. You have answered me. I will sing of your praises in the midst of the congregation. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, right? Psalm 22, he was heard, Hebrews 5, because of his godly fear. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. And yours might not say Sheol, but Sheol is the word for the grave. From the belly of the grave, I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, the floods surround me. All your billows and waves passed over me. Then I said, I've been cast out of your sight, yet I'll look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. That's something. The floods, as you know, with starting with the flood of Noah, but through the Psalms and everywhere, the flood is always the power of the world, the overwhelming power of the world, the overwhelming power of sin and of Satan. And these things have led to the destruction, the death of Jesus on a cross, resulted in his death. And you see in Jonah 2, 5, the weeds were wrapped around my head. We know the Lord had a crown of thorns. He says, I went down to the moorings of the mountains, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Yes, Jesus said in another place in Matthew 16 that he builds his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Hades is the underworld, Sheol, death, the grave. The gate is barred and they shut it and barred it, thinking to contain the Son of God, but it could not be. It could not hold him. It could not contain him. Earth with its bars closed behind me forever, yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Is that not true? God resurrected his son Jesus from the pit, from the grave. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, 
that I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is from the Lord. Yes, and Psalm 22 accords with this as well, that those who are his children are to dedicate themselves to him, that he will sing the praises of God in the midst of the assembly. And our Lord did exactly these things. After that resurrection, there's power, and that power is the word that goes forth. And in this case, it saves people beyond Israel, not just Israel, but all nations, if you will, of Nineveh, why not others? This word goes and it saves them. And in the same way, in chapter 4, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. He prayed, Lord, wasn't this what I said when I was still in my country? That's why I fled to Tarshish before. I know you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. This is what happened when the gospel was preached in the synagogues all over the Mediterranean. Whenever Paul would speak, and the Gentiles would come and listen, they begged that these words be spoken to them again. And in one place it records that almost the whole city gathered the following Sabbath to hear the words of God. And when this happened, the leaders of the synagogue became jealous. And they started to attack Paul and the apostles, the, those that are with him. It's exactly what happened. We hope that Jonah was allowed to learn better. You would like to think because there is a record of it that he was, but we really don't know. And there were some among Israel in the first century who did learn better, as Paul had, as Barnabas had, who had been a Levite, remember? And others, whom, as Jesus uh, portrayed it, uh, could bring forth from their home treasures, something old and something new. Every scribe who obeys the gospel can bring forth treasures, something old and something new. They could make use of the law and the prophets. They could understand these things that had been written before and make that teaching and make that application. There were those people. And we today believe in the same God and in the same Lord, the God who saved Jonah alive and saved Nineveh alive through the words of a messenger, also resurrected Jesus from the dead and can save the whole world through the words that are sent by him. His power is just like that. It's just as great as those things, and those things were really just a symbol of what is to come. The great thing that God has done today, which is not what happened in the case of Jonah, is that he has effected the salvation of the entire world through the blood of his son Jesus. Jesus bought the church with his own blood, and we are all being saved from our sins, which is far greater than any healing, any deliverance from a foreign enemy, any deliverance from an earthly fate. Deliverance from eternal damnation is far greater. Forgiveness of sins is far more difficult to procure. He had to procure it with the blood of his son, Jesus. But that's the sign that Jesus said would be given them. And what he meant by that was he would be resurrected and his words would go forth and the nations would begin to obey. And they were going to have to reckon with Jonah 4. Are they going to sit there angry with Jonah? Or are they going to be among those who can bring forth treasures old and new? Who can genuinely be the help to the next generation? And sharing the scriptures with them. 
Are you a Christian today? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus today? It's time to do so. If not, sometimes we're troubled by the things we read in the Old Testament about things that people did they shouldn't have done. You look at Samson. He seems kind of like a meathead, doesn't he? But you know, it's quite a deal when he, despite or maybe even because he was a meathead, got himself in a place where the entire building is supported and he's got two hands on it and gives his life for the salvation of the people. And the Holy Spirit writes the last sentence on him. Those whom he killed in his death were greater than those whom he killed in his life. The effectiveness of Samson's death was greater. The power of Samson's death was greater than the power of his life. Yeah, Samson himself may have been a meathead, maybe. But the symbol is obvious, right? And Jonah's move, running away from God, that wasn't the right move. But the symbol is obvious. And Jacob showing favoritism with his sons. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. There's going to be problems. But you know, it's fairly clear, isn't it, that there is somebody who's Johnny come lately who is the favorite of whom his brothers are very jealous. So jealous that they cast him into a pit and let out that he was dead, but he wasn't. In fact, God was with him and delivered him from the pit and delivered him from jail and raised him up to be king. Number two in command, actually. The one who would preserve not just the land he was in, but all who would come to him because he had the supply. He had the life-giving bread. That's fairly obvious. And Joseph himself says in Genesis 50, you meant it for evil, my brothers, but God meant it for good, that many people may be preserved alive as it is this day. That's very clear. Yeah, they were meatheads for throwing him in the pit. But it's clear what God meant by that. Open yourself up to these things in Scripture and, and uh, see the great power of God working. It can only be God. It can only be His hand that has done this. No man came up with this. No man could have coordinated this. If you believe in Jesus, it's time to repent. It's time to make your life right with Him. Put Him on a baptism for forgiveness of sins. We'll help you with that. Water is ready. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent before it's too late. Even the Ninevites knew. Why don't we? We ought to do it. Come back to God. He will forgive. He will relent. You know that he wants us to be saved. You know that he is on our side. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known at this time by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing.